Yes. Um, <clears throat> good evening, everybody. This is a um, police department update uh, on May 29, 2024, uh, at 7.30 p.m. here in Town Hall. Uh, we invited, invited Police Chief Brian Gilfeder and members of the police department, which he will introduce, um, to discuss uh, the current status of, of issues uh, in the township of Milburn as it relates to uh, crime, as well as the police department's initiatives. And so I'm going to initially turn it over to Chief Gilfeder to make his introductions. And then we will go through a brief, uh, I would say 20 minute to 30 minute presentation and open it up to Q&A and comments from the public. Uh, at this point, um, <clears throat> we will not necessarily limit time uh, given the, the, the numbers, uh, but we will ask that people <clears throat> say their whole statement, um, make whatever comments or questions they want to uh, end, and then the uh, panel will address it uh, rather than getting into a back and forth and dialogue uh, that uh, that can go on for some time and maybe not allow for others to make their comments or questions uh, known. We also have participants via Zoom. I will say that we will again be cautious um, with that Zoom participation, but we will take Q&A uh, from Zoom as well. And those participants there, we will address the room first and then we will go to the computer and go to Zoom uh, participants. Uh, if the crowd does get larger, we may limit the time in which people uh, have to comment and uh, ask questions. But for right now, I don't think that that would be necessary. I'll turn it over to you, Chief Gilbert. Thank you. <coughs> um, so I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves, but I'll introduce myself. I'm Brian Gilfeder, Chief um, of our Police Department. I have 30 years uh, law enforcement experience. Uh, I've been in the town for 23 years now. Uh, I started first started off in the Hudson County Sheriff's Department. I then moved on to the East Orange Police Department, which is a more urban town, uh, and then came here to Milburn. I've been the chief for nine years now. Good evening, everyone. Um, as the chief, I'm Detective Lieutenant Gilbert Tavares. Um, um, I started my law enforcement career in the year 2000, where I was uh, a correction officer for three years. I worked at Northern State Prison with the uh, New Jersey Department of Corrections. From there, I transferred to the Essex County Sheriff's Office, where I was assigned to patrol division. I worked there for three years. Uh, in 2007, I came to Milburn. I was initially a patrol officer, where I worked for 11 years. And uh, in 2018, I was promoted to the rank of sergeant. I was assigned to the traffic bureau. I ever saw that for a short period of time. In 2021, I was promoted to uh, lieutenant, assigned to the patrol division. In 2022, I was promoted again to detective lieutenant. I am now the commander of the detective bureau. Um, I've been with the Milburn Police Department now for 17 years and currently temporarily oversee the patrol division. Still. I still. <laughs> Uh, good evening. I'm Sergeant Barboza. I'm the traffic supervisor for the Milburn Police Department. Uh, beyond traffic duties, I'm a member of the new hire investigation team. I'm a DARE instructor. I'm also the liaison along with Detective Salemi for MMAC and the neighborhood watch groups. I started my career in Milburn as a patrol officer, like we all do. I then spent three and a half years in the Detective Bureau, where I investigated all sorts of crimes ranging from small juvenile related disorderly persons offenses to burglaries, identity thefts, all the way up to robberies and sex assaults, and of course, everything in between. After being promoted to Sergeant, I was briefly a Sergeant in the Detective Bureau and the Patrol Night Shift. Uh, before being an officer in Milburn, I worked briefly for the Union County Police Department. I started my career in law enforcement, uh, same as Detective Lieutenant, uh, as a corrections officer and then a sheriff's officer. Uh, and I'm grateful that I got to kind of see how the criminal justice system plays out from the moment somebody is placed under arrest to go into court and ultimately uh, if they're incarcerated. Uh, that experience has been very valuable to me in Melbourne. Good evening. I'm Detective Salemi. I am in my 10th year in law enforcement. I also started my career in 2014 at the um, correctional facility for Morris County. I then worked at the Sheriff's Department for, again, Morris County, um, where prior to being hired at Milburn. 
Um, I spent most of my career in the patrol division on night shift. I'm now assigned to the detective bureau. I am trained as a drone operator and DARE instructor. I am also forensically trained to interview children and special victims. I work directly with our schools, um, primarily all of them, both public and private. We have 25 in case you were wondering. Um, I also handle the majority of our incidents involving children, whether they are the victim or the offender. All right, so then we'll get to our presentation. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about the number of officers that we have on the department. Uh, I was here for a number of years. We had 54 officers for the longest time. Uh, in 2020, we had a staffing analysis completed. Uh, during that analysis, it was determined that we should hire six more officers. Uh, so the committee approved four of those officers back in 2020, which we hired. And then in 2023, at the end of 2023, the committee then approved two more officers uh, at that time. So we have three currently in the police academy, which are supposed to graduate tomorrow. Uh, so that's good. We'll be adding them to our ranks. And then they'll go on their field training for three months and hopefully get put right into you know the patrol division. And two more we're putting on uh, in June. We're in the hiring process right now. We're almost completed with that. And then uh, at the June meeting, we'll hopefully, with the committee's approval, put on those two officers. So that'll bring our total officers for the department at 60. Um, now we'll get into the divisions of the police department. We'll start with Lieutenant Tavares. So as mentioned earlier, um, I'm currently temporarily overseeing the patrol division. I supervise 32 officers, nine supervisors. Our officers are scheduled based on our operational needs. Officers are scheduled um, to shifts around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, our officers on a daily basis are assigned areas of responsibility and conduct regular patrols of our neighborhoods. Um, they respond to many different types of calls, 911 emergencies, as well as also conduct traffic and parking enforcement. Um, as far as the detective bureau goes, our functions include, but are obviously not limited to, responding to crime scenes. There are detectives on call 24 seven for critical incidents. We also process those same crime scenes, prepare evidence for submission to the, our state labs and um, investigate crimes and prepare cases for trial. Uh, traffic, uh, some of the traffic bureau functions in addition to maintaining our vehicle and equipment fleet. Uh, as you can imagine, these vehicles are on the road 24 seven. So they're either always breaking down or in some kind of minor accident. And it's our responsibility to get them where they need to go to get fixed and then get them back into our fleet. Uh, we spend a lot of time communicating with utility and construction companies regarding construction work that affects traffic in our township. As we are all aware, there are quite a few large projects currently ongoing that keeps us pretty busy. Uh, on this note, I always like to remind residents that these projects have to do with upgrading our aging infrastructure. Uh, that work must be done. It's not optional. And obviously, we make every attempt to uh, lessen the impact, the negative impact on traffic. Uh, unfortunately, some of these projects, due to the location and timing, uh, sometimes they're a little bit uh, painful uh, for us to navigate. We also organize and help provide safety for township events, for example, the Memorial Day Parade, which just occurred. Um, we had, did have a good turnout for that, I'm happy to say. Uh, the Traffic Bureau does a lot of the work behind the scenes to make events like the Memorial Day Parade a uh, safe and fun experience for all our residents. Uh, beyond that, we have our Oktoberfest, the 5K run, which is coming up next month. Uh, four miler, which is actually happening this Sunday, if anybody wants to sign up for that. And there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes from the Traffic Bureau, other officers, as well as other township employees. We also help out with the schools when they have uh, events like the Strawberry Festival, as well as some religious institutions in town when they have uh, large events, we provide traffic safety for, for them as well. Parking enforcement does fall under the Traffic Bureau, and it seems like every day we're dealing with some kind of uh, parking issue. Uh, we are well aware that at times there is a lack of parking in our downtown. It's something that myself, the Chief, and Alex discuss pretty much on a regular basis. It's something that we're always uh, you know, looking to make not only our residents, but non-residents when they visit our town, we want them to have a, obviously a good experience and parking uh, is one of them. And lastly, we are members of an assistant handling problems brought on, brought to our attention by the Pedestrian Safety Advisory Board, parking ad hoc, 
uh, and Mac, and obviously we have a very close relationship with DNA Red Watch Group. That's it. Uh, so we hit the first slide. Uh, we'll get back to our officers. So the national average uh, rate of sworn officers is 2.4 per thousand inhabitants to 2019 uh, UCR, which is the Uniform Crime Reporting. Mr. McDonald, do you want to explain? Sure. Um, so at times we're always asked about uh, budgetary figures when it comes to the Milburn Police Department. And so we wanted to provide some information, some comparisons surrounding communities, uh, particularly those uh, in close proximity to the township of Milburn. Uh, and as you can see by this uh, table, uh, the Milburn Police Department uh, comes in second in terms of the total police department budget for 2023. These are all 2023 figures. Uh, our operating expenses are $759,300. Um, and the salary and wages include only uh, our uh, 60 uh, officers as it relates to the table of organization. On the next slide, um, we just do a little bit more of a comparison uh, in terms of the number of officers uh, per a table of organization. As uh, you may be aware or, or recognize that this can fluctuate at any time, depending on retirements, depending on the uh, time it takes to hire officers, that goes for any community. Uh, there will always be some lag in when someone retires as well as when, when somebody is hired. Uh, but this will give you the number of officers in the surrounding communities, as well as the size of the town, the population, the total spending per capita, which again, Milburn is um, leads at $463.92 uh, per capita. And also, uh, with the exception of Florham Park, which has 3.58 officers per 1,000 residents, Milburn has 2.76, which is above the national average that was just indicated of 2.4 per 1,000 residents back in uh, the year 2019. Um, and so these are just some, again, uh, questions that have been asked in the past and, and some, some stats and figures as it relates to the Milburn Police Department comparison to communities close to us. So before we get into the meat and potatoes of uh, what we're talking about, burglaries, crime, car thefts, we just want to go over some definitions because sometimes people are talking about one type of crime, but they actually mention a different type of crime. So I'm going to have Lieutenant Tavares just give us a brief overview of uh, different crimes and their meanings. So before we continue, just to clarify some of the terms that we uh, use that, that seem to cause confusion, some terms that are being used interchangeably when they really should not be. And, and the, the terms are car theft, carjacking, burglary, home invasion, and robbery. So to explain this in the, in the simplest possible way, uh, these terms that I just mentioned, um, car theft occurs when an actor steals a vehicle. An example would be an uh, individual walks up a driveway, gets in inside of an unlocked vehicle, the keys are inside the vehicle, he turns it on, drives off. That's a car theft, basically. That differs from a carjacking. People mentioned carjacking. Um, carjacking occurs when an actor threatens or uses force against a person to physically take a vehicle from them. So an example of a carjacking would be a person sitting in their car, they're approached by an individual, the individual threatens them, orders the person out of the car and takes that car by force. That's a carjacking. Can understand how those two differ, a car theft and a carjacking. Um, a burglary. Burglaries occur when an actor <clears throat> enters a home to commit a crime such as a theft. An example of a burglary would be uh, an individual breaks a rear window of a, of a random home, enters the home, and steals valuables from within the home. People confuse and use the word home invasion interchangeably with the burglary when they're not the same. A home invasion is when an, uh, when an actor enters a home knowing that the residents are present with the intent to commit a violent crime. An example of a home invasion would be an individual targeting a specific person, knowing they were home, breaking into the home, entering the home, confronting the resident, usually to uh, commit like a violent crime, um, attack them or, or something more serious. That, that would be the difference between a burglary and a home invasion. A lot of people also, you know, use the term robbery when they don't actually mean to use that term. Uh, a robbery is when an actor threatens 
or uses force against a person to commit a theft. And an example with that would be an individual approaches a person, assaults, threatens them in some way, takes something from them, a wallet, a handbag, that would be a robbery. So these, these terms are sometimes confused and used interchangeably when they really shouldn't be. Uh, a car theft is simply when a car is taken. A carjacking is when they actually physically, you know, use force or threaten a person to take that vehicle from them. Uh, uh, a burglary is when, you know, they, they enter a home and commit a theft. A home invasion, that's usually, a, a, you know, some type of violent crime in, involved with it. And uh, a, a robbery is, you know, when they, you know, actually use force or threaten force against a person to commit theft. Thank you. We're going to now go over some trends in home burglaries and car thefts. So prior to 2023, uh, the criminals were looking to steal vehicles. What they would usually do is, we've probably all seen videos of this, they'll usually run up a driveway, pull up on the door handles. If the vehicle opened, they would get inside that vehicle. They would attempt to start the vehicle if the key fob is in it. It would start, they would take off, and then you have a vehicle theft. What started occurring last year is they started going one step further. If they saw a car they really wanted in someone's garage or, or driveway, uh, and they, that car was locked, now they're attempting to gain entry into that home with the sole purpose of getting the key fob to then go back and take that vehicle. And I'll just let uh, Detective Salemi kind of explain how they're getting into the homes. Thank you. So just to elaborate on what uh, Sar Sergeant Barbosa just said, we have seen cases where the burglars have used um, second floor windows to gain access into homes. Um, you know, pried open exterior windows and, and smashed windows or glass doors um, at the back of residence. There are primarily two different groups that we're dealing with, the first being juveniles, um, which are what Sergeant Barbosa just explained. They're operating in groups of about two to five. Their primary focus is stealing motor vehicles. Um, they'll, trip, they'll typically try to enter doors and windows near the garage. Um, they'll also target high-end vehicles in driveways. We have seen camera footage where they, you know, climb on top of each other to peer into the garage. Um, the second group is more organized. They're working in groups of two or more. They appear to be part of a larger network and utilize more planning. They're also targeting residents without cameras that have neighboring uh, neighbors without cameras. Now, um, those homes, they're not really looking for vehicles. They're targeting for high value items like cash and jewelry. They often enter from the back of a residence because they don't wanna be detected and they think they'll, they're less likely to be observed. They will also wait um, and, and they will not enter the home when the residents are present. With this group, we ask that you look out for out-of-state plates, rental vehicles, unprovoked honking, or strangers approaching a residence to ring or knock to see if anyone's home. We also ask that you try to work with your neighborhood watch community to determine if an uncommon vehicle is in the area, and you could always reach out to us um, if you're unsure. Another example would be an individual wearing masks, gloves, um, or face coverings. Um, obviously that's not typical in the summer. And again, the majority, the large majority of our burglaries are for high-end motor vehicles. Uh, so we got asked about the Kia Hyundai challenge. Uh, this was made famous uh, due to TikTok. Uh, this is not something that's occurring a lot in our town. Uh, I think it's because we probably don't have a lot of Kia or Hyundais in town. Um, the cases we have seen have been at the mall, but it's not something we've really seen in our jurisdiction. All right. So I'm going to go over some uh, statistics um, that we've seen in car thefts, burglaries. Uh, first, I'll talk about car thefts. In statewide in 2021, we saw an increase of 22%. In 2022, there was an increase of 10% above that. And then in 2023, there was a 5% increase. Uh, this is statewide. Um, and we have the slide up here that shows the trends right now. This is something that's put out by the Rock by the state police now. Uh, it started getting put out when car theft started increasing drastically in the state. The red line is this year. The blue line is last year. And then the mean is the yellow line there, as you can see. Um, 
just yesterday, there was 26 stolen cars in the state of New Jersey. Uh, and then if you go to the next slide, uh, on the side there, that lists all the counties. Uh, and the map right there is a heat map that they show. So the blue dots or the blue splotches are where a lot of car thefts are going on. Uh, the red splotches, of course, the heat map, that's when we, it gets hotter, which is that's Bergen County above the top red dot. Hudson County is to the right there. And then where the yellow is, that is Essex County. And that's where we are right in the middle of. So that is the hottest zone in the state of New Jersey. So in 2021, we had 43 car thefts. Um, if you want to turn to the next slide. In 2022, we had 47 car thefts. Uh, 2023, it went down to 29. But if you include the home uh, burglaries where they went in to take a car, it's 38. But when they do reporting, so I can explain a little bit, if someone breaks into a home and steals a car, it just counts as a burglary for crime reporting stats. It doesn't count as two separate things. So that's why I'm explaining like it's 29 car thefts, but with the car actually taken, we'll just add it on to the car theft. So that it was 38 total. And then for 2024, so far this year, we've had three, if you count the ones where they broke into a home, which we just had one recently on Pine. And we had one last month, I believe, where they broke into an exterior garage, detached garage, where they took a motorcycle. It's five total for this year. Um, last year at this point, we had 18. So it, a dramatic decrease in car thefts this year. Um, if we go into burglaries, we had 23 in 2021, 10 in 2022, uh, we jumped up to 34 in 2023, and so far this year we've had 10. Um, and at the end of May, we're towards the end of May, so we're, we're wrapping up in two days. Uh, we've had we had 12 last year at this point, so we're lower by two this year. So crime has <clears throat> has decreased a little bit for burglaries, but a lot for car thefts. Um, So burglaries happen in all areas of our township. It's not just dedicated to one area. Um, so some areas of town that we've had burglaries already this year, Ridgewood, Great Oak, uh, West Beechcroft, Byron, Evergreen, Dorison, uh, Mechanic, Winthrop, Randall, Pine. So it's sporadic across the town. It's not just, it hasn't been for this year, just pigeonholed to one section of town. Uh, and the times that these are happening is basically a 50-50 split where it's evening to later evening hours to overnight. It's not all overnight. Um, if we can go to the next slide. That just shows how it's, the red is this year, which is just flat, as you can see. Uh, the blue was last year. If you go to the next slide. And then are the all, show are all mall stats built into this? It's all included. Anything that happens at the mall is included we're in getting everything. That, sir. We're getting to that. What we're getting to. That. Okay. So if you if you look at the chart there, you can see that you know crime has decreased by 54 for this year in all the categories. Um that was last year, and this year they're trending to decrease even more. Um, the one thing that went up last year, of course, was the home burglaries and Part of that reason was because they were trying to steal the cars out of the garages. And if you go to the next slide. So in 2022, where are the TV, uh, we had 392 arrests and you can see that 48 were juveniles. And then you can see the dramatic jump to 2023 where we had 451 arrests. And that, that includes the whole town. That's like all crimes in the township, not just burglaries or car thefts. Uh, but you can see the dramatic jump in juvenile arrests 
50 males and 36 females, which is 86. And that, that's a dramatic jump. They're, they're using juveniles to commit a lot of crimes where they did it a little bit. Now it's a dramatic comparison. Um, so I'll now go to we'll give some tips. Yeah, we'll do some tips real quick. Uh, so we get asked a lot, what, what can residents do to, to help? Um, what I would tell you is the number one thing you can do is to join your local neighborhood watch group. Uh, it's free. Uh, it's an easy way to get to know your neighbors. Uh, you might realize that you actually like some of your neighbors, so I recommend it. Um, the neighborhood watch group meets, we average it out, we pretty much meet every month. Um, and it's a good way for you to, you know, voice your concerns and, you know, it's a good way for us to exchange ideas back and forth. I also get asked, when should I call 911 versus when should I use the non-emergency line? And the rule of thumb there is if it's an in-progress incident, if it's happening in front of you, you got to call 911, okay? If it's something that happened yesterday or you feel like it's going to happen, you know, a day or two from now, then you can use the non-emergency line, which I'm sure we can give to you at the end of this. Um, one thing that keeps happening is residents, for some reason, keep waiting till the next morning to call us. Or if it's a Friday, they'll want to wait till Monday. If it's happening in front of you, you need to call us immediately. If somebody attempted to break into your car and you're not calling us, well, okay, they didn't get into your car, but the problem is they're going to keep trying. They're going to try to get into your neighborhood. <coughs> so in order to prevent that, you need to call us. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. All right. We also get asked a lot, um, kind of about the trends with the car thefts. Our most common type of car theft is still an unlocked vehicle with the keys in it. Um, that's that's our most common. Obviously, it's typically a crime of opportunity, so those are just the easiest to take. Um, so we do want to, um, you know, just show a little bit of appreciation at least that more of our residents are locking their vehicles. Um, we were at about 30% of our incidents with locked vehicles last year, and we're already up to 50 this year. 50% of the vehicles are being locked. So we want to thank you for that. Um, we'd also, um, there's no way to say this without it kind of sounding like a little bit of a brag, but um, our officers are really working and, and doing a great job, not just independently, but also working with other agencies in recovering our residents' vehicles. Um, we have recovered 94% in 2023 and 96% so far in 2024. The state average is 50%. Um, as Sergeant Barbosa mentioned before, we have seen a few Kia Challenge car thefts at the mall, but it isn't very common in our area. Most of our motor vehicle thefts and burglaries involve the targeting of high-end motor vehicles. Those would be your BMWs, your Range Rovers, your Audis, your Bentleys, your Lambos, um, just to name a few. One of the uh, the questions that we get asked a lot in uh that residents seem to have like apprehension with is, is giving their, their information when they're calling um, these situations in. Uh, residents are allowed to call, anybody's really allowed to call in these, you know, situations anonymously. However, we always do recommend that the resident, you know, provide their, um, their name and contact information. Because a lot of times, you know, there's, there's follow-up that we need to do or questions that we need answers to. And we always encourage that the you know resident you know provide their name, telephone number, just in case there's any more questions. We give them a call back, you know. And, but um, you know, well, residents are always welcome to uh, to call and you know report any uh, suspicious activity anonymously. Uh, and, and while I'm speaking, I wanted to add, you know, if, if there is ever anybody uh, on your property like trespassing, you know, that that or any unknown person, you know, definitely call nine one one, you know, right away. Um, don't hesitate. There, there, there shouldn't be people walking through your backyard, cutting through or anything like that. You know, if uh, if it's not somebody that you welcome, that you allow to be on your property, you know, call us, you know, immediately report that. Just to cover kind of the, the current methods um, for getting into residents, going through an unlocked door or window is typically the most common and that is what the juveniles primarily do. As the chief mentioned, that is our increase um, at the moment. But we have had some cases where um, certain like subsects of those juveniles have used crowbars to pry open windows 
and doors, you know, leading into the garage. Um, the more organized group, um, again, they use second floor windows. We have arrested them and seized ladders from them. Um, they're also using glass break tools and breaking the glass of rear windows and, and doors. Um, again, just to reiterate, they are taking high value items, primarily vehicles, but also cash and jewelry for that second crew. The clearance rate on our burglaries for residents, the average in the US is 13%, Melbourne's at 25. We have apprehended numerous offenders, um, but as with any open investigation, we cannot talk about the specifics and especially with juvenile matters, which is a lot of them, they're automatically confidential, just um, so you're aware. So we're just going to talk real quick about what some of uh, what residents can do to better protect their homes and their vehicles. And I'm going to start with the obvious, and I know you've heard this a million times from us, but we're going to keep saying it. And, you, and the residents have been doing a great job, which is don't leave your key fobs in your vehicles uh, and definitely don't leave your garage door openers uh, in your vehicles. If you have a ring device or... Um surveillance camera that is very beneficial for us in um, not just with you know solving the incident quicker it's also helpful for when these cases go to trial um, it does you know increase your odds and, and increase our odds of getting you know a, a more adequate punishment for the offender with that being said if you do have um, cameras on your property, please um, make sure you know how to access them or, or you have access to them. Um, it's okay if you don't, but if you do have access, the faster we get that video, the faster we're able to kind of um, apprehend these people. Um, if you can set your camera up to be motion activated, I know those alerts can sometimes get a bit tedious, um, but having that and us being able to respond quicker is definitely very beneficial. Uh, if you're planning to be away from your home for an extended period of time, please make sure you're not sharing this on any kind of social media. Uh, stop your mail, newspapers, package deliveries while you're away, or you can just arrange for a family member or a neighbor to pick that mail up. Uh, if you're going to be away for an extended period of time, just make sure that you have a automatic timer. You can buy them on Amazon. Um, they're they're afford very affordable now. And they'll basically just turn your lights on at night. Not all the lights in the house, but at least some that, you know, if somebody's driving by, it seems like somebody's living at that residence. Keep watch over your neighbor's homes and ask them to do the same for you. If you belong to the neighborhood watch group, you can just tell your block leader, hey, I'm going to be away from town for a week or two. And they're going to, you know, keep an eye on your home. And obviously, you're going to return that favor. Never leave keys under doormat, doormats, flower pots, mailboxes, or any kind of secret hiding places. You know, please don't do that. Sorry. So um, I know we typically don't like to um, think about being the victim of a crime, and obviously we all hope that you never are. Um, but just a couple of things to keep in mind uh, prior to anything ever happening. It is a good idea to keep like an inventory list of all your valuable items, photos, serial numbers. Um, we've had numerous occasions where um, the detectives were able to locate uh, a stolen Rolex, for example, because they were provided the serial number. Um, we kind of are as good as our information sometimes, and you will need that. Um, God forbid anything happens, you will need that list, uh, not just for insurance, but for us as well, so that we can you know, try and locate your items. Also, please keep a copy of that, you know, not just in your safe, but, but somewhere else, um, maybe another location uh, where you can make sure that you always have access to it. If you do have a safe, um, the first place a burglar will look will be the master bedroom. So <laughs> please um, try to keep that in a more hidden location if possible. And if you can bolt that to the ground, um, the more time you buy yourself, uh, the more likely you are to have, uh, you know, less of an incident happening. As far as alarm system goes, the old school audible alarm is by far still the best thing to have. 
<laughs> and uh, so you guys got to move around. Yeah, we got to move around. Once um, we'll get up. So we've seen numerous videos time and time again. The thing that spooks the burglar the most is that audible alarm. Um, with that, just please keep in mind a lot of times with your audible alarm, there might be a delay for when they call us. Maybe it's five minutes, maybe it's 10 minutes. You want to check your settings. Um, I would say put no delay um, because let's say it does go off accidentally. You can then let your alarm company know, hey, it was an accidental um, activation and they can cancel us before we get there. But we'd much rather be there in real time. Um, and a great example of that where we will, we were able to apprehend people was uh, we just had like a like an all-star resident calling us as it was happening, um, you know, as his home, as the burglars were attempting to get into his home, our patrol officer, the patrol officers were there within minutes and apprehended um, the suspects. So that's always very helpful to us. The faster we get there, the faster we get them. Again, I'm gonna just keep mentioning those second floor windows that the back of your residence, please make sure that's always locked. If you can put an audible alarm or a glass, glass break alarm on the back of your house, um, again, that's very beneficial, especially around the garage. Um, also, they are choosing low lit residents with a lot of, you know, bushes and shrubbery to conceal themselves. Um, the last thing they want is you or your neighbor seeing them back there and then calling us, right? They don't want to be noticed. So if you can light that area, put cameras back there, whatever you can do obviously helps. And this kind of goes without saying, and I mean, it's your prerogative, it's obviously your home, but try not to keep large amounts of cash and valuables inside your home if possible. Uh, very important to make sure your cleaners, nannies, gardeners, contractors are vetted. Right? If you belong to a neighborhood watch group, you can ask another member who they use and then make sure they're already vetted uh, by that member. Don't let them just bring friends or family members over. Make sure they're vetted. Okay. One tip that we uh, definitely, you know, recommend is parking your vehicles inside your garages. Um, the, I don't know if you've been on uh, Google Maps. You could do like a street view now, and they have like that Google car that drives around and records everybody's houses and the cars that they have in front. And and um, these groups are after these high end <laughs> vehicles, so they, they they see a nice car in front of your house. You know, if they're you know fishing through Google Maps. You know, they'll, they'll target your home, you know, they'll, but if your car is inside the garage, you know, it, it won't be that accessible to them or, or if they're coming by, they're not going to see that vehicle out there and, you know, attempt it. Um, one service that Google does offer is to, to blur your home, blur your vehicle. If, if, if it is captured, if there is an image of it online, um, if you go on Google maps, there's a, a selection for report a problem. And you could select your home, you could select, you know, whatever area in front of your property that you'd like blurred. Um, Apple also has a, a feature like that. If you contact the customer service, you know, that the platform will actually block out, you know, your residence so that it doesn't show up when it's searched. Um, we also recommend, you know, residents, you know, contact uh, real estate sites like Zillow and Redfin who are, who are posting your homes and, you know, um, posting images, you know, and, and get them either either removed or or claim them so that you know no fraud like occurs against your 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 real estate your property. Um, you know those could also be reported on the on those specific sites. You know by contacting their customer service. Just to kind of piggyback off what the LT said. Yes, we do ask that you keep your um, cars in the garage if possible. Um, we have seen some burglars utilize Zillow, Redfin um, in obtaining images of the interior of a home. And oh, this is this is also a big one. Please lock your inner garage door. Um, I'm guilty of it as well, leaving that open. 
you want to make sure that's locked and that you're not storing your keys directly um, next to that door. Uh, if there is police activity near your home, uh, we ask that residents remain inside their homes. And if you have cameras to the exterior, you should be monitoring those cameras. Obviously, if you see something that is suspicious, you should call us immediately. Um, we further ask that you not leave your home during that time because then you're gonna just be another vehicle out on the road that the officers are gonna to have to stop to make sure that you're not the criminal that we're looking for. So basically, if there's any kind of police activity on your block, just don't leave the house during that time. For valuable items and your vehicles, we do recommend that um, you put an external tracking device if possible into the car. Um, we also recommend that you secure your Wi-Fi networks. If you do have the ability, make sure it's on to automatically update and make sure that you check that occasionally to make sure that nobody's using your Wi-Fi unauthorized. Obviously, password protect that. All right. So next, we're going to go into giving a lot of tips for what the residents should do. Now we're going to go into telling you what we have been doing as the police department. So we have been doing, um, one of the main features we've been doing is burglary patrol and adjusting our resources uh, to areas of town that seem uh, more action. Um, one thing I can't tell I can tell you is how many officers, I know it's been asked before, how many officers are working per shift or what sector? That's something we don't give out. Uh, we don't wanna give the burglars or car thieves a tip on where we are or how many people are there. So that's something we hold close to, our, to the best. Um, but, um, so I just wanna play a video if you wanna play that video now. This is kind of a nod to our officer that we just lost. He's actually patrolling the area in Wyoming. He sees this car like on the border of Maplewood, Wyoming area, these loop lines. Um,
100 hours of burglary patrol this year, which is just dedicated to driving our residents streets for burglaries. Um, as you can see there, uh, between 2023, 20, um, January 2023 and April 2023, we had 838 hours. This year, we're already up to 1,209 hours, a 44% increase in that. Um, we're also working closely with our local partners. We haven't been tighter in these past couple of years with Livingston and Summit than we have ever been because they're going through the same thing that we're going through. So we're always backing them up. They're backing us up. Um, it's, it's just been a closer bond just because of all the action that's been going on between all of our towns. Um, we've installed fiber optic lines with cameras, license plate readers. Um, currently we have 28 license plate readers and cameras combined uh, at different locations. If, I mean, you got the slide up already. And if you want to hit the video that explains the license plate reader system. This is uh, Arizona, correct? Glendale, Arizona. The police response, so they made a video for a quarter roll of this. But this is the same system that we have. Another area that we have really developed is, is LPR. So in the city, uh, we've had license plate reading uh, on a mobile platform for more than 15 years. Which is great for capturing data as they go through parking lots and recovering stolen vehicles that have been dumped and they could have been there for, you know, for days, weeks, who knows. So this license plate reader gives us a different perspective on things because every vehicle that goes through there is at risk is occupied by a live body. So that presents an opportunity for us to actually make an apprehension right then and there. We had 30 hits in 30 days. The first, you know, 30 days. Now this is one lane of traffic. And so we knew that we would probably be well suited to enhance that. So we had some conversation with Mobile and we've since built that up. We're gonna be very shortly at about 12 locations. I think the LPR technology really helped us all with that investigation. Uh, you know, our data and how uh, long it pertains ultimately can help us if we have a specific suspect or if we're trying to go for getting a suspect, we can use that data from the LPR. We've had tremendous success with it. So um, we've had one that probably led to every other crime. So we've had we've had stolen vehicles where there's you know, so say there's four people in that vehicle, all four of them ended up having felony charges, not necessarily related to the vehicle theft. Ten years from now, people look back as us uh, being a pioneer in this type of policing and technology. I think that Glendale has a lot of major events that we all have a responsibility to have this type of technology. So that's the same system that we currently have in town. Uh, we were one of the first agencies in this area to have it. We started off with the mobile units that are on the cars. And we went to fixed LPRs. Um, and what's great about the system that it's interconnected with other towns. So as other towns get this, these devices, it connects to the, the whole network and we can see cars that are driving. I mean, we had hits already on 78 this year. Uh, I mean, today, you know, we prepare ourselves, make sure to go on 24, make sure they're not coming into our town. So it, it integrates well with other towns and the other areas. Um, other things we have going on are undercover vehicles we have out. Uh, we have a drone unit. We have two drones at this point. Um, we have vacant house form, which is online now. It's form fillable. If you're going away for a period of time, you can fill out this form, uh, send it to the email that's on our website. Uh, we'll do checks at your house. We'll drive past just so we know. If we see, we know you're on vacation and we see somebody walking on your lawn or in your yard, we're going to know, hey, this person doesn't belong here. They shouldn't be there. Um, we also put out notifications now about our burglaries and attempted burglaries. You can sign up on the township website uh, for our, our rave notifications. Um, so rave is just a platform that our township uses to get out our messages. It's similar to Nixle. Uh, Nixle is also just a platform to get out your message. Um, we also are starting tomorrow. It'll be on our website. We're implementing our home security assessment. Uh, so you'll be able to sign up online tomorrow. We have three officers who are trained in this. They'll make an appointment with you. They'll go out to your house. Um, 
they'll look around your house, they have a checklist, make some recommendations to you, and then they'll, they'll actually hand you the form you know, with all the recommendations that are on that. And then we are also looking into the security tower, uh, the security light tower to deploy that to areas that may be getting hit more than other areas. It'll have video cameras on it. Uh, today, I just got back the quote for that. And we're also um, going to be starting up a community policing unit. So that will be starting probably the end of uh, August, early September. Um, so to be able to connect with our community better. Some of the programs that they're going to have are the home ex that home security assessment will be through them. Um, bicycle patrol, bicycle safety, child passenger safety technician, crime prevention. It'll be Halloween safety, internet, coffee with a cop, pizza with a cop, national night out, um, our headquarters tours, we have Project Lifesaver, uh, 911 education, DWI education, and start police, uh, junior police academy. All these things won't happen in September, but they'll be integrated as we go along with the program. <laughs> um, so I just want to bring up for our next topic, a case that's just was put on my desk today. Um, and this will go on with the next topic. So one of our supervisors uh, received a court notice for one of our uh, criminals. So he was caught in Milburn already for in a stolen car and then also caught for burglarizing a resident in the town. He has seven prior arrests, all for motor vehicle theft and five pending cases in court right now. And this was, his case was sent back to our municipal court. So I know I've said this before in the past, but I can't get it through enough because no matter what we do, if there's no penalty for the criminals, they're just gonna keep coming back. So I beg you to please call your senators, legislators, and have them make stricter laws, stricter sentencing, pull back the bail reform because it's imperative. If there's no penalty, or cases just linger on forever, we're gonna get a little bit of headway, but not much. If you can put the next slide. Next, next one. So um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna go through all of this, but I just, we wanted to provide some slides uh, for the residents that provide information about legislation that's out there that is currently being considered. Um, mm -hmm or that has been passed. Uh, this, is, it, this is important because as, as um, I'd like to say, I think there are three prongs to how we go about um, you know, dealing with these, with these issues. One is obviously our police department and the efforts and initiatives that they're going through, as well as their, the, their job of patrolling in, uh, uh, the streets and our residents and making sure that they're doing the things in their own homes to protect themselves and protect their property. And then the third prong of that is our legislature and making sure that they're making uh, choices about the laws and penalties and things that, that help all of those things um, come together to, to combat crime. So this is just, again, a couple of slides listing those uh, various legislative activities that are taking place, those in, uh, uh, senators or assembly people that are uh, sponsors, co-sponsors. It's a little hard to see. Uh, on, on here because it actually links to their particular page on the legislative website. So if you wanted to contact them, if you wanted to provide um, your support for whatever they're, they're, they're doing or how can you become more involved or, or whatever it may be, I think that it is also important. Uh, our own township committee has taken proactive steps to make sure that they're supporting legislation that makes sense um, to combating these issues as well. Uh, every once in a while, you'll see uh, a resolution on the township committee agenda that supports uh, a legislative initiative that increases the penalties, um, you know, uh, to home burglaries or to car thefts or uh, or juveniles that are committing those crimes or people that are using juveniles to commit those crimes. And so all of this is very important. And as the chief said, I think it is, uh, you know, our plea and our ask as well to the residents to make sure that you're contacting legislators and uh, and providing your feedback on this uh, issue, um, uh, particularly when it comes to property crimes. Uh, which is, you know, certainly the one that we are most concerned about here in Milburn um, and uh, making sure that they're continuing our own legislators um, and they are listed on the last slide with their contact information 
uh, that they are supporting these initiatives as well as we are all their constituents and we want to make sure that they're supporting uh, the legislation that uh, assists our community. Um, so just, you know, we don't need to go back to it, but we also included a slide uh, as it relates to the capital spending in the police department because that's just another uh, aspect of spending that takes place um, for police department initiatives. I know that it's been said, you know, you know, uh, why don't uh, why don't we, you know, just spend as, as much as we can on whatever is needed. Um, you know, we do we've spent almost four million dollars on, on capital spending since 2019 when it comes to the police department. That's a variety of different things. Um, but there's also at times not necessarily a uh, a uh, a one particular, you know, piece of equipment that is going to you know help solve. Uh, an entire issue. So um, $1.5 million on LPRs, uh, you know, is, is a significant expenditure for a community. Uh, we are spending another additional $150,000 plus on additional locations. Uh, we are always co um, coordinating with the mall to make sure that we have adequate LPRs and, 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 uh, and crime fighting ability up there. So uh, this is a consistent sort of um, um, conversation and making sure that the police department is provided with whatever um, is is needed. Uh, and obviously, technologies are changing, things will continue to evolve, and we'll continue to support the police department in whatever uh, aspects they need and in, in, in when it comes to, uh, to finances. Um, with that, that was way longer than a half hour. I uh, appreciate everybody's patience. Um, and um, we're going to open up Q&A. But first, I'd just like to mention that uh, obviously, this is an important topic, and um, unless I'm sorry, Chief, are you I'll complete? Yep. All right, great. Yep. Um, so, this is an important topic. Uh, I just want to recognize that our uh, Mayor Annette Romano, Deputy Mayor Frank Sacamandi, as well as Committeeman Cohen, Committeewoman Prupus, and Committeeman Stoller on, on Zoom are all in attendance to listen and to hear from the residents and their questions and concerns, uh, as well as everyone that's here and presenting uh, tonight. So, um, the one thing I'm just going to ask is that this remain a uh, community uh, uh, information session, that we all remain cordial uh, and, and, and pro have proper decorum as we address our questions and our answers and, and, our, uh, and our comments. Um, again, we're not going to put a time limit necessarily on it, although we do have, um, I think, now 35 people on Zoom. Is that correct? Yeah. So, um, so we could get long in our comments and questions, but um, we'll we'll just take a you know a pulse of the time and and certainly want to make sure that we hear from everybody. If everybody can also just be respectful of the amount of time they're taking, we are going to wait until you are complete in your questions and your comments, and then we will address them. Um, and we will not wait until the end of everything to try to address all of them. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, I think we'll open it up to the room first. I'll bring the microphone out if anybody wants to come up and ask a question uh, or provide a comment. All right. Thank you. Yeah, come up to the mic if you don't mind. So that everybody can hear you. Thank you. My name is Matthew Nola. I live on King Road. I was down here three weeks ago after we had some robberies in the neighborhood. And I believe the deputy mayor said he's gonna meet with the police and come back to us and let us know what's happened. And I know for a fact that you guys put on Winthrop, you put a police car there, which was empty. I assume that there's a camera in there taking pictures and I see today they just moved it to a different place and a different car. So whatever good that does find, at least that's the only thing that I can see that has been done. I don't know what else has been done to prevent the problems we've had since then. Uh, that's the first question. The other question I have, and I'm glad you brought it up from a legislative standpoint, who determines what the penalties are for robbing a car, breaking into a house? Does the county, is it the state, or does the city, the town, decide what the penalties are if you create, if, if you uh, crime is created in that town. Who has the final jurisdiction of what the penalty is? 
It depends on the crime. It, the law is made by the legislators, so they determine what the penalties are. Judge follows the laws, and it depends on where the where of the, the town. The well, that's what I was saying. So it is the state that determines what the penalties are, regardless of where it is. Right. So I assume that they're probably, and it's only my assumption that your biggest problem is a more liberal viewpoint from the, the large cities in the state than we would have, because that's where most of the crime is. We would like the, the laws to be more hardened. Yes. Yes, that's all I have. If you could respond to to yeah, the so first part, area, like, like, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I I just want to I just it's just so that we can keep things moving along. I just don't want to get into a back and forth yeah. because something he may say then prompts you to say something yeah. else. So if you just if you're completed I'm, with your comments, I'm completed. You can, yes, have a seat, and then the chief will address it. Thank you. So in the, in the Winthrop area, like you said, we have a car up there. We've increased the patrols in the in the area. I mean, other than that. Following up on the crime, that's, that's what we're doing at this point. I would actually just add something. We shouldn't keep talking about that, that we have these cars up there. Let's just not keep mentioning it over and over because I've already heard a lot. I get it, this, but let's, between as a community, right. let's all just stop talking about it. We know what's going on, that's it. Let's not mention it again. Okay. So last. Um, my name is Jeffrey Feld. I live in a poet section. Again, thank you for this session. I want to go back to some things that were said very earlier. Uh, you are a power military organization. Like, is there a table organization? Because when we heard about the three divisions on the patrol, I think it was 31 officers and seven supervisors. How many are in the um, traffic area? And then how many are detectives? Have you considered using auxiliary policemen who are usually retired policemen, um, like in the court system rather than a full-time officer, or when we had to do the construction, the auxiliary policeman could be used rather than a full-time policeman. But I think if we have like a, ch a chart to understand the organization, like how many, you know, in the patrol division, um, there are X number of captains, X number of lieutenants, and X type of patrolmen, because you didn't really break out um, I guess the other 22 police officers that we have, how, how many detectives we have and, and, and how many um, um, are in the traffic control, which I assume would include now the new drone division, which I'm happy to have you know, to do. But I applaud you in use of increased technology. Thank you. So we can get you that table of organization. Uh, the drone division, the drone operators are actually in the patrol division. They carry the drones with them as they go out on shift. And auxiliary police are basically uh, almost non-existent now in the state of New Jersey. Uh, I know another couple of towns they use yeah. it. Uh, Springfield, Cranford, uh, they, they, Springfield, I don't want to get in the back and forth yet. I'm just going to answer. Um, <laughs> Spring, Springfield, Cranford, they also have auxiliary. I think what the chief is referring to is that, you know, generally those are volunteer positions. As you know, volunteerism is, is difficult uh, at times. And oftentimes auxiliary police are also, whether if they are younger auxiliary are gonna be, they're looking at that as a stepping stone to become a police officer. Unfortunately in Melbourne, some of those, in, and it's the same sort of circumstance when it comes to volunteer fire, is that we are a civil service community. So then therefore people take an exam to come on to our departments. And it's not always a simple path as in other communities such as Cranford and Springfield that are not civil service the, to have an auxiliary police officer or a volunteer firefighter or, Remember, work in that town, get some experience as a volunteer in one of those roles, um, and and then move into a full time position. Um, again, not necessarily. I mean, there are potentially other routes, uh, whether it's a uh, you know uh, SLEOs and things like that, uh, special law enforcement officers. But you know, those are similar similar time frames in terms of higher uh, academy things like that. Uh, auxiliary police don't generally have any sort of. Um, um, arrest power. They're used for, as you pointed out, traffic control or something like that. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, that has been something that has been explored. Um, I, I, I don't know. I think Milburn had an auxiliary police department probably uh, 30, 30 years ago or something. See, back in the eighties and yeah. maybe the nineties and then it was disbanded. I know like Livingston's uh, auxiliary police department is kind of dwindling at this point. Um, it's basically 
a bunch of, of, of more older residents there and then slowly it's getting smaller and smaller. I just wanted to add the reason why I mentioned the number of uh, officers and supervisors in the patrol division is because that's our most heavily staffed division. All of our other units, bureaus, you know, are, are a much smaller number of uh, personnel. And just to that conversation that you two are having, it's hard these days to hire full-time police officers. You're talking about getting people to do it without getting paid. So if, it, if we struggle to hire full-time police officers and you're talking about hiring volunteers, I can imagine that's not going to be an easy thing to do. The auxiliary program I was talking about are paid officers. They're usually retired policemen that were used like in the municipal courts. I'm coming from examples of like the urban areas, like in Orange, to fray the cost they brought a, they created an auxiliary police department, which was a lot of the retired cop policemen for being used, let's say, in the municipal court that we have, rather than having a full-time policeman. And that is currently what we do. We have a retired police officer that works the court on Tuesday. We also have a retired police officer that uh, is in our sign shop, as well as a retired police officer that handles technology in the police department. And they're not included in that 60. They are not. No. Hi, um, Frank Sackmandy. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I got some of these numbers right. So in 2024, to date, we've had five car thefts, and that's inclusive of the home burglaries, right? Correct. And uh, I think you guys indicated that you recovered 96% of the stolen vehicles in 2024. Yes, as, as far as recovery goes. So that would be that the vehicle was returned to the owner. Right. So mathematically, do you see how that doesn't quite work out? You can't have 96% unless you have at least, I think you'd need at least like 23 car thefts for that mathematically to work out. How, do you have, how have you recovered, you know, 6% of a car? So that's basically just averaged and including all of our motor vehicle thefts, burglaries, and how many cars we have outstanding. So were some of the cars that were recovered, perhaps ones that were stolen in the prior calendar year? It's basically, I just did the last two years. So we have a spreadsheet that we use that tells us what we have recovered and what we don't. Um, to get you the exact numbers, I just wrote the figures down. I don't have them. Okay, I'll follow up with you guys offline. Um, all right, and um, the case that just came across your desk that was kicked back to the municipal court, is that one that we can then use the new municipal ordinance uh, to try and impose you know, some sort of municipal fine? Or That's something that the time? prosecutor would have to impose okay once once it gets to back to the court then it's in the hands of the prosecutor and he determines how he's going to go on with the case whether or not to use the ordinance that the committee passed or we're actually trying to get it kicked back to the superior court where it should have stayed right uh, but yes we can use that or the prosecutor can use it i hope we'd utilize that if all else fails I will, I will so. something is better than that. all right thank you very much Hi, good evening. My name is Pooja Parikh. I'm a Short Hills resident. Uh, thank you for being here tonight and for your time um, and you know, all of my experiences with our police department in my various roles in the community, but just also as a resident have been positive and professional. Um, so just with that, I've seen a lot of positive work uh, moving forward. And one thing I noticed, I you know, find the advisories that come out to be helpful. And I'm wondering if it's possible to um, consider what would be necessary for them to be uh, escalated to more real-time advisories. So issuing, um, you know, real-time when things are happening, just so we could be more proactive in locking up if it's, you know, for home and this is happening during an early event or evening hours, or if, um, you know, we know something's going on, we can avoid that area or stay out of the way of drones. So I just would like to know if that's something the police department um, can consider, or if, if you are considering, I don't know, um, I'd love to know where, uh, it, if it's feasible and what would be necessary for it to be feasible. And if it's something that's not um, possible, I'd like to understand if we could get some insight into the, the I guess, the reasons that it wouldn't be um, something that we could do so we can understand what they are um, and hopefully just, you know, proactively find some solutions. But I know uh, for myself and many community members, I think we would love to have more real-time alerts issued 
so that we can, you know, be aware and, and try to plan accordingly. So that's all. Thank you so much. So the real time alerts. Oh, sorry, I just, usually we go back at township committee meetings. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's okay. no, that, I mean, that is actually how we're. Oh, awesome. So can I, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So the real time alerts become very difficult because you would have to have somebody dedicated to sit in the police department and put out these alerts as they're going on. Usually when there's something going on, like a burglary to a house, like every every officer, supervisor is up in the area trying to look for the suspect. So it's never going to be really real time. Um, but what the officers usually do is they'll go house to house and talk to each resident to see if they saw anything, you know, uh, see if they have any video. So the residents in that area will usually know what's going on at that time. But as to put it out community wide, like stay out of the area, is usually very difficult to do because you would, you would need almost someone dedicated just to be putting out alerts. Maybe just to add to that, it's also you know um, certainly um, I think what what's being discussed uh, here tonight too is is that you know uh, vigilance and attention to how you're protecting your home and locking up and things like that is not is not a uh, something that we just do when something's going on, but something that we get into a practice like the residents have, you know, with locking the cars, but it's something that we're doing at all times, uh, no, no matter the circumstance. Um, so I think that, and I, and I do, I think I understand your question as well, um, Ms. Freak, and just, you know, I think some of that difficulty is sort of that individual that is, is specifically dedicated in the police department to doing that. Um, and perhaps is something that will be addressed and, um, you know, uh, looked at when it comes to the police staffing study that was just uh, approved by the Township Committee um, to, uh, to look at the police department. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dean Pasternak. I live on Hobart Avenue. I have, um, I'll just list my questions um, about the traffic in town. What are your views on how this is um, trending and how it impacts crime and safety in our town? Um, the types of businesses coming into town. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking about Upper Milburn Avenue where I was just sitting today outside. You know, there's a massage place, cigar lounges. Like, how are these kinds of businesses impacting our crime and safety in town, if at all? Um, how are officers being trained uh, in interacting with uh, actual or potential situations involving people experiencing mental health crises? Has there been additional training? Uh, are there plans to do more? Some towns, I think, have a program where they call in um, mental health professionals to go with officers. Is there any plan to do such a thing in Milburn? Um, on the resident safety check that you're initiating, is there any opportunity for people to get some ideas on installing uh, cameras and other safety devices? Like, can you actually give recommendations or is that something everybody's gonna have to figure out if they don't have cameras? Um, and then the last thing is uh, the neighborhood watches, which I, I know I stood up here three years ago and, and asked if we could, could bring in. So I'm really happy to see that happening. And I really appreciate all the people that are working on that. I know Pooja, you did a lot of work and I know there's some other people um, that are very dedicated to it, but I, it seems to me it's a bit disjointed at this point, like it's sort of funneling into one person or two or something. How do we get like the whole community really motivated and involved in this? I, I just know it's in the early stage, but that's one observation that I have. Thank you. Hi, I'm Raquel DiPerna, um, uh, Living Church Hotels. Maybe a good time for me to introduce myself. Um, <laughs> I started the Neighborhood Watch, and um, I just want to I just want to address the question that um, it is it is very early stages. The Poets Watch is much more mature, um, and there are people who have been helping, and there is a core team. But it's um, I mean, if I say I spend about twenty hours a week on that, it might be conservative. I don't think a lot of people have time to put into it. And I think that's been some of the issues, but if there are volunteers, there are people who noted on their forms, they want to help. I'll be organizing some of those people together. So appreciate everyone joining. 
Um, also to note, if you haven't joined, you wanna join, please do. Um, not every group has block captains, not every group is as organized or in different states of maturity. Some, uh, most of them, all of them are vetted at this point, but it is, a, it is an effort and, and to keep people's privacy um, concerns uh, at bay. It's, it really is funneling through me just to make sure that we're not putting out people's data publicly. So I think that's, that's the other reason why it's, I kept keeping a little more close to the vest with some of the data. Um, so to, to just make a comment here, I've um, been taking a lot of notes, but this is super helpful for me. I've, um, we've been working together for a while on sessions and Sergeant Barbosa has been generous to do so many. Uh, I've learned more here. Um, I learn more every time I go, but I think the stats are very helpful. Uh, I get a lot of the questions coming in, funneling every day from the neighborhood. And um, I think the stats will help us sort of understand and put in perspective um, recently, Ben Stoller put me in touch with Summit and, you know, they're having questions and want to model, model some stuff after our neighborhood watch. And I think um, other communities are starting to pay attention to what we're doing. Um, from my perspective, uh, a lot of the questions I've funneled through have been answered very productively and we've been able to make a few changes. Um, so I applaud you guys for, for working and partnering with us on that. I think we are leading the way uh, for many of these towns and communities around here to start. What I think makes the biggest difference with the watch is really just the community. To It, it builds looking out for each other, um, like Sergeant Barbosa noted. I think just in terms of like, I've seen the patrol numbers increase of 44%. I think that, is the biggest difference. We see people coming into poets, knocking on our doors, telling us our garage doors open, please shut it. Um, and, and I mean, and if we, you know, if we start to think about the cycle for getting policemen in, and maybe that's aspirational to do more, but right now what we can do, it seems to me is just that patrol increase is hugely notable and makes a big difference. And, uh, you know, we all wave as they go by because we know that, we know that it's a very big effort. Um, so I, I think that's it. Just thank you for this presentation. I know it took a lot of work. I know it's been a tough week for you guys or last week for you guys with a loss of your own, which um, has been on all of our minds. So thank you for taking the time out and, and putting this together for all of us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Do you guys have a chance to answer Ms. Pasternak's yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so sorry. That's my fault. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll go off the Neighborhood Watch uh, program. So it probably seems a little bit disjointed only because Neighborhood Watch is, is, was formed for neighborhoods. It wasn't initially formed to be a town-wide uh, project. So that's why I know a lot of uh, communities in our residence have been leaning on Raquel as you know, a great source. Um, but just like she stepped up for the poet section, if someone wants to do it in say South Mountain section, that person has to like kind of step up and take on the responsibility for that. That's, that that's, that's sort of how that works. Yeah, how would that? Well, I think that's conversation that? maybe you probably want to have with Raquel okay. because she would explain to you what exactly. It's me, it's like. Right, it's right. Yeah. But she would know better than us okay. what it takes because yeah. neighborhood watch group is not the police department. Right. It's, okay. It falls on the our residents, so. so. Is, is, is this, is Raquel, is that your name? Is she the only one interacting with? Police. That, that no, she just happens, happens to be the one that's putting in the most I time. Think. So, okay. All right. And, I just right. and to <laughs> note that you're you're holding meetings with the police department that includes many other people, not just for Cal. So, like, I think yeah, uh, yeah there's you know, been other. There's been uh, there have been you know I know Pooja has been involved as well. So it, it's not just one person. There have been other members, but yeah, obviously Raquel's putting in those hours. So my interaction with her is going to be more than with other residents. But it's okay. Like you're open to that. Having other people absolutely yeah. okay. i mean I, i'm sure raquel prefers it if we have <laughs> residents step up in in the deerfield section in yeah. the south mountain section in the wyoming section that ideally that's what we want to happen do you find the neighborhood watch signs that raquel proposed in our area to be successful or helpful uh can, 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 we can't do back and forth yeah. it's just not gonna be uh, so, so we'll go on just to finish the, answering mrs Preston's next question next, uh, next question about the traffic, we haven't seen traffic cause crime. Uh, what did you say they can't do? Not crime. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there is increased traffic in town, but I don't see that. Like a connection between traffic and crime. We haven't seen any of that. Um, 
the types of businesses in town, um, cigar store or what have you, we haven't seen any correlation between a store in town and crime either. Um, our officers are trained in mental health. Um, we have training, every, you know, multiple different trainings. One of the training is mental health. We also, if we go to a scene and there seems to be some type of mental health crisis, uh, we take those patients to, it's, uh, we can have the, a mental health counselor if available from the county come in. If not, we will take them to the hospital ourselves. Um, and then your last question uh, about the residents uh, doing the survey at residents' homes. Uh, we will give recommendations of kinds of cameras, but not specific brands or like manufacturers, but types of say alarm systems or types of camera systems, but not specific brands. Um, anyone else in the room? If not at this time, if there's anyone online that would like to raise their hand, um, we'll take some uh, Q&A from Zoom. Hi there, thank you for your time, Perry Urso. Appreciate the presentation. I'm actually up on Upper Milburn Avenue. We've been a business owner for 30 years. And I'm just wondering, I have a question about, um, unfortunately, I actually mentioned this in front of the TC recently, is there, there's actually, actually hasn't been, if any, police presence to the business owners. Now, look, my concern is certainly my resident, the residents, because those residents are our patrons. But as a business owner of 30 years, I have to honestly say, and it's sadly you lost Officer Lyons, an officer that we fortunately did not know. Um, so I just wonder if there's going to be a little bit more or is it too much to ask to have a police presence? I mean, they used to be on bicycles, walk, motorcycles. We don't know any of the police officers any longer. It's very sad. Um, and back in 2021, and, I'm, and I apologize because I'm in and out of the uh, meeting tonight. Did you mention, anybody mention about Nixle? And can you tell me your pros and cons about Nixle? And if you're for it, against it, and what's your reasons? for it or against it. And I think that's it pretty much. And again, thank you for your service. And certainly we want our police officers that are on the streets and protecting us. I hope they have what they need to protect them as they're protecting us. So thank you so much for your time. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so as, um, we were talking about earlier about the community service unit. Part of their jobs will be to walk uh, downtown or Upper Milburn Avenue, stop in with the store and the homeowner, uh, not homeowners, but the stores, um, just to get a relationship back together. Um, I know I told some of the committee members this, but like um, probably a lot of our officers back in the day went to school here in Milburn, probably knew a bunch of our residents, but those officers have retired and have been replaced by newer officers who didn't happen to go to school here or live in town at one point in time. So there, there has been a little bit of disconnect, which has been our push for the community service unit. So to get that back, we're going to have the officers walk downtown, meet the residents on the street, stop in stores and get that connection back. Uh, as for the Nixle, like we have said, Nixle is just a platform to get out your message, just like we have with Rave. Um, I don't see much difference between Nixle and Rave itself that I know of. Um, that's basically it. Yeah, um, just to just to touch on Nixle and, and Rave is that you know currently the township uses Rave um, uh, for all of its communications, um, and you know I have noticed in various communities that you know it's just a a, a preference. You know we do have surrounding communities that use Nixle. We do have surrounding communities that use Smart Nine One One or the Rave mobile system. We currently have a database um, already established of those users uh, on the Rave mobile system. Uh, it is close to uh, 7,000 um, individuals, 3,000 phones, something like that, um, as well as 2,600 uh, that are currently signed up for uh, police department alerts. So um, just encourage, continue to encourage everybody to sign up for that. Um, but it is, a, it is a system that is capable of calling, emailing, and texting uh, those individuals that are signed up for. 
and I believe Nixel, you know, has very similar capability. I don't know that Nixel has the capability of calling, but it does have the ability to email as well as text message uh, individuals on uh, advisory alerts, uh, similar to uh, the Rave mobile system. Hi, right, can you guys hear me? Yes, yeah. Yes, we awesome. can. Awesome, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, well received, good data. Uh, appreciate the data. Uh, to begin, first of all, my condolences on Officer Luke Lyons. Uh, uh, Mayor Romano and I attended the wake. I've never been a sadder moment, but it was so inspiring with all the unity from Springfield and Summit and Livingston and all of the other towns coming together, not only police officers, but elected officials. That was fantastic. It was uh, very inspiring. Um, pretty much uh, my questions were answered. Um, in terms of the community policing, I mean, I I'm down in Savannah for my daughter's graduation uh, and Sergeant Parvoso, uh, yeah, I met you first eight years ago in my living room when that daughter was actually planning a, a march and parade for a freshman at the high school. So time flies when you're having fun. Um, so, you know, in terms of getting to know the police officers, I, I really want you guys to push National Night Out. Uh, you know, obviously we're going to um, uh, push it out to the, to the residents, but it's a great opportunity for everyone in the community to come out and meet our officers. So once again, thank you guys very much for this uh, opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Can't hear you. I think you're muted. Sorry. Hi. Uh, Sarah Sherman, South Mountain Civic Association. You dropped our name, so I have to respond. Um, there is a neighborhood watch in South Mountain. Um, it's under the umbrella of the South Mountain Civic Association. Uh, we met with Raquel, who gave us a great deal of advice on getting started. We met with Sergeant Barbosa, Detective Salemi, um, with officers, and then we held a large meeting for our community. So what we have found works for us, because not everyone wants to share their data, is that if we have the block captain system where one individual is responsible for uh, the contact information for a two block area or you know some part of the community, um, or if they have a, an email list or a WhatsApp, people are much more comfortable with that. So um, this is working for us right now. We have decals that are available to members of the uh, neighborhood. And um, I would encourage other, other communities to do the same thing. Um, it, it, I think some people don't want to be part of a very large townwide group. They really want to keep it um, particular to their community. South Mountain is an old, small community. And there's, you know, different sense here than some of the, um, the newer communities in town, uh, the larger communities in town. So um, we like the way it's going. And um, thank you for doing this presentation. And thank you to uh, Sergeant Barbosa and Detective Salemi for the work they do on Neighborhood Watch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a good point that uh, she just brought up is that when you have your neighborhood watch, you can mold it to what your residents or communities wants to do. It doesn't have to be cookie cutter. Like everybody doesn't have to do the same thing. Your community or your neighborhood could do one thing and another neighborhood could do another thing. You know, get out your message, figure out how you're going to watch, watch your neighborhood. It's all just in your neighborhood. Um. Just one thing that I'd like to point out, kind of going back to um, Mr. Perna's comments uh, in terms of the statistics, uh, we've, I, myself, I've been looking at quite a few uh, police department websites um, 
and and websites over the, over the last uh, few weeks. Um, one thing I just want to remind residents is that we do have a um, a section on the township's website uh, called Key Performance Indicators, uh, which has some of these statistics uh, on a monthly basis, uh, some other statistics in the town uh, that are not necessarily police uh, related, but you know data that we furnish on a monthly basis uh, to the community. Uh, if you're interested, and I, and I did notice that, you know, Melbourne is one of the few, if only, you know, one of the only communities in our surrounding area that actually up, offers up those stats so that people can view the number of home burglaries or car thefts or cars recovered um, in, uh, in our community uh, on a monthly basis and see how things are trending. So it doesn't have to necessarily be guesswork or, you know, uh, hearsay or, you know, um, anything like that, you can actually go in and look at, at the statistics on a monthly basis, uh, which I think is really important. Uh, it's something that now you, you know that we keep an eye on, that we are aware of, and that we're actively addressing as you see those things, and um, or as we see those things, and making sure that it's it's something that is um, it's provided to the community so that they're also aware. There are written questions as well. Written questions? Yeah. Then <clears throat> um, we send around the materials shared on the screen. Yeah, there's there's no uh, there's no reason these these materials will be put up on the website. Can we overlay the Millbury Town KPI crime stats you shared on a per capita basis and compare it to the other similar towns in New Jersey, Summit, Chattanooga, and kind of white outline the last option? Alpine? <laughs> not sure not sure the comparison there. clusters in bergen county yeah yeah um uh, we'll have to read that one yeah. we'll, we'll address so, so, that. just so everybody knows that a lot of these stats are pushed out nationally and, and through the state like, it, it went from being uniform crime reporting and they switched two years ago to nibers which is national uh, crime reporting and that's pushed out by the state police so and then do we have any sense of where the most where most of the crime is coming from in terms of city, neighborhood, specific gang, or any other type of group that might help us deter these bad actors? So the most crime in Lower Township is at the mall. But where is it coming from? Is the... well, where is it coming from? Okay. A lot of our actors are coming from New York. Um, with the shoplifting, they're coming from the Bronx, Staten Island. Is that all? Yes. Okay. Is there uh, is there any further questions? Uh, we'll go one more time to the room. Um, what, what's the penalty what, for shoplifting? What kind of shop? <laughs> it really depends. <laughs> at the mall. No, but are you stealing a hundred dollars? Are you stealing ten thousand dollars? Depends on how much you're stealing. So it's over six hundred. What's the uh, over six? Is, uh, you have to claim it on your taxes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know exactly what the penalties are, but I, I know they are based on the the retail value of the item that's stolen. I mean, and they they go up. Um, in relation to the, the value of to the resale value of the item. And then once the person's say found guilty, then a lot of it's on the judge to determine what the penalty is, whether or not you've been caught one time or ten times or twenty times. You know, if that's all imposed by the judge. If it's a first time offense, sometimes it could be no penalty. couple additional questions. Um, so it occurred to me, you guys have been doing a great job arresting people, it seems like the past two years. It would be great to know what percentage of those individuals that were arrested actually were convicted and what percentage were just released. I think that'd be good for the community to know so that the community would be motivated to speak to you know, members of the assembly and the state senate to try and put pressure on them to stop this catch and release nonsense because it seems like if you're catching all these people, if we actually help them, you'd be starting to run out of criminals pretty quickly, right? Um, 
Number two, um, have you guys looked into the star chase system? I, I noticed that video with the car chase, um, you know, something like that. The star chase system is something that fires a tracker out onto the vehicle that's being chased, and then it's linked up with a GPS. And I know it's being used in Connecticut and some other states. I'm wondering if that's something we can look into here, whether we could sign up for a pilot, if you guys think that would even be helpful. So we did actually have uh, two of our officers go to the Meadowlands to see how the company, uh, it was just basically a demonstration of it. I know the state police was there. There's many different agencies there. Uh, so usually in the state of New Jersey, when there's a new product on the market, the state police will usually test it out to see how it works. You know, if there's not huge liabilities associated with it, they'll usually implement it into the state police and then the municipalities will follow suit. Um, so right now that's not something the state police use. Uh, I'll assume they're in the testing phases with that uh, if, if they thought it was a good idea when they were at the demonstration. But if they do implement, they usually push that out to the municipality. Is that, can I just follow up on that? Is that something that is also, you know, sort of usability or feasibility of a, of a system like that? Is that determined by the attorney general in any way? Yeah, so yeah, the state police and attorney general usually work hand in hand on uh, products that come out. Um, I'm gonna turn this way. Good evening, everyone. I am Assemblywoman Bagoli. I am your representative. Um, I was asked, I was told by uh, your mayor, Annette Romano, that you were having this meeting this evening, and Frank has invited me to some community events that have been occurring and keeping me, um, kind of giving me information of what's happening in Melbourne. Um, I've had the opportunity to listen to some of the residents tell me about the situation that's happening, and I wanted to thank uh, the TC for approving um, and sending me information on a support of an assembly bill. I know that you asked what legislation was out there and what could be supported. Um, there, I did receive notice that an assembly bill that I proposed that would uh, supported my film burn is being supported by the township. And that's bill number A2000. If you can contact legislators and let them know to please support this bill as well. It's a bill that um, kind of creates a, no more catch and release. If, if there's a minor, um, there this bill is also sponsored by Sheriff Shanique Spate um, and Benji Wimberly of Patterson. It's a bill that says if a minor is caught, they're going, if first offense, obviously, it's going to be like, you know, they're going to be jailed for 30 days, second offense, 60 days, 90 days, and so forth, right? We don't, it's no longer that you're going to be caught and then released the next day, you know, to the custody of who. Um, so this bill, if you were to support it, which your town council is doing, but if you were to contact legislators to push it forward um, and have your voices be heard, this is how we get legislation to get off the ground, right? We write bills and we need your voices to kind of get them off the ground and moving. Um, so that will help a little bit of the, those concerns that you have with penalties and fines and, you know, incarceration of, of minors that are coming into town and, you know, um, committing acts of, that we consider to be criminal and keep ourselves protected. If you need me, if you would like to contact me, I am in the Livingston office um, on Mount, old Mount Pleasant Avenue. Um, you can just go to find your legislature on NJ Ledge and you'll be able to find my contact information very easily or just Google my name, Rosie Bagoli, um, and you can feel free to contact my offices at any time if you have any ideas, or any bill ideas that you'd like me to move forward for you. I'm happy to do that as well. If you have any constituent concerns or needs, you can always reach out to my office. So I'm a resource to you. I am available to you. My offices are right next door. Feel free to contact me. And thank you again for moving this legislation forward and thank approving it. Thank, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for voting no for the Oprah Act. Thank you. Thank you for voting no. Um, I, I think I, I wasn't quite clear about my question on the mental health thing. There, there is a, such a program called Arrive Together and some um, townships, and I, I don't know whether it's countywide or what, but that's what I was referring to. Do you know what townships they are? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just did a quick I search. Know Essex counties, I know yeah. they haven't, I know Union County, they're, they're, Union, they're relying Oregon. on it a lot. Essex County is kind of just rolling out what they right It's now. just starting. Yeah. I, I, I have to say, based on my own situation um, uh, and observation, that I think it's really important I think that um, people do their best. A lot of people are very ignorant, including parents, 
family members about mental health. And I think uh, a lot of bad things happen that don't need to when people are educated and understand what that person is going through. And I'm really speaking from my heart. There's so much unnecessary um, long-term damage that's done, both to the person trying to respond to it, as well as the person going through a mental health crisis when it, it, it involves um, and escalates to the point where police are involved. So I, I'm just really here asking as strongly as I can that that be considered for our town when Essex County gets, gets going on this. Thank you. I would just, uh, just add that we do have several officers within our department that go to additional training uh, crisis intervention training, um, but obviously, um, you know. I've noticed a, a bit of a, an increase in, you know, just um, understanding and talking to some of the policemen. And I, I, I applaud you for that. I think it's great. And it's really necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you. Well, again, uh, thank you everybody for coming. Um, thank you to the police department, police chief, uh, for all the, the valuable information. Tomorrow, uh, the website will go live for the home assessment program. I anticipate it being very popular. Um, so there will probably be um, some time, uh, obviously. And, uh, you know, uh, as, as we sort through that list. Um, but uh, again, the website will be live tomorrow. We will also post uh, this uh, slide deck as well as the video online tomorrow as well uh, for the community. And just, uh, again, thank you, everybody, for coming out and, uh, and hearing it. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.